And all I want to do is lay it all down Pour it all out at your feet You know, one of the things that's difficult for graduates is to go before others, and sometimes this happens in church settings, people want to hear what your plans are for your life. Like all this pressure, you, you spend all these 12 years of school, you've just gone through high school, by now you've got it figured out, right? And so I remember hearing kids, and I was one of those back when I was in high school, start to tell the audience what they're going to do, and someone will say like boldly, like, I'm going to go to law school and get my license and practice law. And, and someone else says, you know, I'm going to be a, become a scientist and I'm going to uh, solve global warming. And, and someone else says, you know, I'm going to become a microbiologist or an astrophysicist or some other six-syllable word that we know very little about. And, and we go, wow, oh, that's awesome. Such great dreams. And inside they're saying, like, I have no clue what I'm doing. You know, I just, I just got through school. I want to take a break. I like to just get a job at Sonic and hang out with my friends a little bit, but I can't say that. So we come up with stuff because it's hard. And even though you make plans and may, may uh, look into the future and say, that's what I'd like to be, uh, how, how many of you are actually doing what you went to college to do? Anybody? Anybody? Mo <laughs> Very few? Well, yes, you guys, because you're musicians. There are companies staying here from South Carolina. They're unusual. <laughs> But most of us, like, like I, went, I was planning to be a computer programmer. I ended up being a pastor. Uh, our daughter got a master's degree in English literature, and she sells Mary Kay. And our son has a degree in photography, and he works in the tech department at Widefield Schools. I mean, just we go off to college with one plan, and it just gets us moving, and then over the course of time, things changed, and things get interrupted, and, and God opens up different doors. We end up somewhere else. You know, I picture most of us either one of, like one of two people. I call them drivers or drifters. A driver uh, is someone, think about it this way. In Colorado, a lot of people like to go whitewater rafting. It's a great place to come, and so in the spring, um, you get all geared up, Put on the wetsuit, you've got your oars, you, you've got a vest on, you've got your guide on your, on your a boat, and you head, head down that river, and, and you dig in deep so you avoid the rocks, and you, and you make sure you're angled to the right uh, angle to get through the rapids, and you just attack the water. I mean, you're just going at it, and it's thrilling, a little dangerous, people can die, whitewater rafting, every year a few die in Colorado, but it, it's exciting, and that's what they set out to do. But then there's others who I, I call like tubers. Like, you just get on the inner tube, you just go with the flow. And you just drift. Wherever the water takes you, that's where you go. He says, I'm just going to follow the current. Not a whole lot of work. And I think there are drivers that, that go through life saying, I'm going to attack it. I know what I want to do. I know what I want to achieve. I know how much money I want to make. I know all these things. And someone else says, hmm, let's just see what happens. Let's just see what happens. There, there's those who make life, ha make life happen and those who take life as it happens. And most of us fall into one of those two camps. But there's such a value in planning. You may have heard that to fail to plan is to plan to fail. We need to know where we're headed in life because it's important. Remember Alice in Wonderland when she met the Cheshire cat? She said, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the cat said, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. And Alice says, I don't care much where. The cat said, well, then it doesn't much matter which way you go. Alice says, so long as I get somewhere, and the cat says, oh, yes, you're sure to do that. <laughs> you know, we all are somewhere, but are we in the right place? Are we in the place that we're supposed to be? Are we in the place that God wants us to be? See, to get where you want to go, you have to make plans and take steps. Sound plans and sure steps. That's what we need to do to get to the place where we need to be. But even then, even then, when you make those plans, you have to be careful. It says, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Proverbs has so much to say on virtually every area of life. And if you're not with us, Solomon was a man who became king of Israel. God um, really gave him like one magic lamp wish and said, what would you like? What do you need to be king? And kind of the expectation was he'd ask for power, fame, money, and he said wisdom. He says, I feel like a little kid. And I have no clue how to, how to lead this nation. And God gave him an abundance of wisdom, so much so that people came from miles around 
to gain wisdom from Solomon. And so a lot of his wisdom is captured in a book called Proverbs, and we've been looking at Proverbs and how it speaks to so many areas of life. And, and there's a lot to say about planning, about the direction we go in life, about the way we go with our lives. But as the poet says, the best laid schemes of mice and men often go askew. Because you may set out with a plan, and I think there's some people here they went off to college or got in the military with a plan for your future. It didn't work out that way. Or you had a plan that you're going to get married to that great guy, a beautiful girl, and you're going to have kids, and buy a house. It's not worked out that way. You had plans that you're going to live well into your 80s, and you're not doing so well physically right now. That wasn't your plan. You had a plan that by the time you reached retirement, you'd have a nice nest egg set up there, and, and you'd be prepared for it, but you're not. And maybe some of you had plans that when you got old, you would be able to celebrate your 50th anniversary with your spouse. It's not going to happen because one of you is not here. And I can't help but think of this family here in the Widefield community and their little six-year-old boy. They just went out for a hike in this nearby neighborhood, and he got bit by a little baby rattlesnake. And that boy, because of the power and that venom of that snake, passed away this week. Do you think that was anywhere in their plans? Absolutely not. So what do you do when, when you say, well, God, you know, I, this is, you tell us to plan and this is the way I plan it, but it's sure not working out as I planned. I just want to tell you, you'll get a bigger answer at the end of the message, but it's still the wise thing to do, to plan. And then watch what God works when you do. So I want to say a prayer before we go into looking at a lot of scriptures that are found in the book of Proverbs that give us guidance in this area of planning and then carrying out our plans, the steps that we take. And I'm going to ask you, especially those of you who may be at a place of life where you're feeling like, uh, I gave up on planning. I planned stuff and it blew up on me. I, I had plans and it didn't work. So I pray that God would stir something within you to feel like maybe, maybe there's a second chance to do this better. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom found in this book that Solomon gave us. And I pray, Father, for really healing of our hearts as we seek you and seek your direction in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. First thing I find in Proverbs is that we should create plans with wise advice. Bill Bright was a man who founded Campus Crusade. It's now called Crew. And he developed this tool uh, for sharing the gospel. It's called the Four Spiritual Laws. Some of you may have known it. Some of you may have been saved by it. But the very first law is this. God loves you. We sang about that today. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Do you know that God has amazing plans for your life? Do you know that, that, that God wants good things for you? See, there was a time in the nation of Israel's lives where they disobeyed God. They got drug off into captivity and, and they found themselves in some very difficult spots, broken, discouraged, wondering if God loves them. And through the prophet Jeremiah, God said, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans for hope and a future. Plans for good and not evil. God has plans for you. So it seems like if God has plans, why doesn't he just tell me what they are? I mean, why me bother planning if God already has plans? I'll just sit back and you tell me what the plans are and I'll tell you if I want to do them. Well, honestly, God has a general plan called the general will of God. It's really the same for everybody, that we would know him and walk in relationship with him. To have faith and trust in a living God who loved us, who put us here on this planet. That's the same for every one of us. But within that overarching will of God is a place for you and I to exercise our own personal will. That we actually get to exercise how I want to love God, how I express my faith in God. And it may look different from person to person. See, it's a unique gift we have to do that. Do you know that in nature, nature doesn't get that choice. The planets always follow the same orbits. The sun always comes up every morning, goes down every night. The moon has its rotation every month. Wasn't it beautiful just a few nights ago when we saw the full moon? Uh, but it can't, it, it just, it'll change slowly by slowly. It just has its cycles. That's what nature does. Um, animals don't have that freedom. Animals operate by instincts. You know, it's this time of year. It's time to fly south. It's this time, time to fly north. It's this time to lay the eggs. It's this time to molt the skin. It's, it, it just, they, they have instincts and they just follow that. But human beings made in God's image are so unique. We imagine, dream, make plans, carry them out. It's a beautiful thing. Whether you write a song, uh, paint a painting, build a building, design a car, uh, fly someone to the moon, uh, develop a cure for a disease. We have so much creativity. 
within us that God has given. But if you don't use that to make plans, you have other, there's other people just willing to jump in there. There are advertisers and marketers who know what you need to buy. They have a plan for how to spend your money. Entertainment uh, media, YouTube, TikTok, and TV, and Hulu, and, and the theaters all have ideas of how you should be spending your time. The news stations, a lot of the major news stations have a, have a plan for how you should vote. Parents, we often have plans for our kids, don't we? Don't, don't, you, don't you have kids and start to say like, oh, I, I want my child to play baseball. I want my child to, to learn karate. I want my child to play a musical instrument. I want my child to go to college. I, you know, I want my child to, to marry a, a decent person. You know, we have all these things that are, that are in our plans for our kids. I was watching America's Got Talent the other night, and there was this lady on there. She's a comedian. And she said her mother has been pressuring her, saying, um, it's time for you to have the grandbabies. And so, so the mom seeks sending her these emails of, of pictures of cute little girl outfits. And so this m- lady's getting kind of bothered by it. So to get her mother to stop, she started emailing her pictures of cute little nursing homes. <laughs> People have plans for our lives. It's a, it's a beautiful ability, and it's a sacred responsibility. So in Proverbs, it says, the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his ways, and the prudent gives thought to his steps. In other words, you're, you're thinking about what you're going to do. You think before you act. You consider you, your steps. If I make this decision, is it taking me in the direction I really want to go or not? You know, all through your day, you're making choices, and, and usually those choices are going to take us down a healthy path, an unhealthy path, a spiritually healthy path, a spiritually unhealthy path. Which is it? Take, take thought. Jesus said, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid his foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. You know, Jesus says, if you're going to accomplish something in life, play out the scenario. Think about it. Evaluate it. Can you do what you're setting out to do? Is it wise? Is it something you can accomplish? At the peak of Stalin's rule of the Soviet Union, they had a contest. Uh, to have someone design a building that would house their government. And the winner was this uh, building, designed this building 415 meters high. It was a pyramid-like structure with seven concentric cylinders, each one a little bit smaller than the other. And at the very top was to be a statue of Vladimir Lenin, a 328-foot statue, which would have made this building taller than the Empire State Building. They began it in 1938. And then this thing called World War II happened. And they actually borrowed some of the steel from it to use for wartime machinery. And they never got back to that project. They actually scrapped it in 1957. And ironically, in that very place now is a church. Isn't that interesting? God had different plans for that property. See, the wise person makes realistic plans to carry out. Not every, not every plan is big and grandiose. I mean, there's a lot of things that you, that you plan every day that are just simple like... Um, what am I going to wear today? What's my plan for my clothing? Uh, what's the plan for dinner? It's not earth-shaking, but it's a plan. Um, what, are we, what are we going to do on vacation? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Plans are laid out. Um, those are like small-level plans. But then there are bigger plans like, what job do I want? What school should I go to? Who should I marry? Is it time to have kids? Should we buy the house? Should we go back to school? Should I get a divorce? See, those kinds of decisions not only affect you, they affect other people. That's why it's good to have other people involved in those big decisions with you. In fact, I would say if you're married, it's always wise to include your spouse in determining those decisions. It says in Proverbs, here's a couple verses, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. God has put in our lives other people who speak wisdom. It's like they're another set of eyes, another set of ears, another brain to think about these things. They often see things we don't see. Several years ago, an elder and I met with a young couple in the church. They were considering uh, taking a job with a new church plant in town. Now, this job didn't pay anything, at least at the start. The promise was once they started getting people, they would start to make some money. 
And so when we, we sat down with them saying, could we talk to you about this decision you're about to make? Because you are leaving a job where you have a steady paycheck, you're a full-time employee, and you're, and you're giving it up to go trust God with a job, and you, you have no guarantee of any income, and you have two kids in your house. You need to put food on the table, and you have a, a mortgage that you have to pay. And they felt like, well, God's leading us. God's really put it on our hearts to do this. And as we, we listened, and as other people in the, in the church talked to them, even their parents talked to them, all we were seeing was red flags saying, you know, God could be behind this, but you better be sure this is God because the consequences of this could be very big for your family. And oftentimes, people will play this God card. You know what that is? Well, we just believe God's telling us to do that. I'm not going to listen to anybody else because I believe God's telling me. And you know what happens so often when I hear that? When someone says, I don't listen to anybody else's advice. I'm just going to trust God on this one. Down the road, things blow up. Things deteriorate. Things don't go as planned. And in this case, they came back months later and said, we made a mistake. Made a mistake. I thought God was behind it. See, it's, it's a fine line between faith and presumption. You really want to make sure. And one of the ways God validates the plans that he's putting in our hearts is he confirms it with other people who say like, that sounds like a really good plan, but have you thought of this? Or, or may it be this time instead of that time? Let other people speak into your plans. Make plans with wise advice. But once you have those plans, then submit those plans to the Lord. Submit those plans to the Lord. We are in the process of building a steel building right here on the side of the property. It's going to be a maintenance building. It'll house all of our um, storage, all of our um, seasonal things, a lot of our machinery, it'll, it'll house a little work area, all that stuff currently downstairs below, right below you, it's going to get moved into there so we can finish the classrooms that we've longed for down, down below. But in order to get that building built, the first thing you have to do is submit plans to regional. And they have to look them over and make sure everything's in the right place and you get all the things you need and the right access points, the right number of bathrooms, the right number of outlets, all those kinds of things. And those plans have to get approved. That's a, that's a lot of work and sometimes a lot of waiting. But think, if, if you have to do that for a building that houses stuff, how much more do we need God's approval for our plans? Wouldn't it be wise for us to lay our plans before the Lord? It says here, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. You may have it in mind, but God needs to say yes. Stamp that kind of thing. Now, how does he do that? Oftentimes, God says yes through someone else. You knock on the door and God opens the door. Good example of this is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king of Persia. And he heard that the people back in Jerusalem were having uh, struggles because the city had been destroyed with fire. The, the stones had been pushed down. And they needed leadership to come and help reorganize the troops and rebuild that and to um, tolerate the, the verbal attacks from the nations around them. And Nehemiah just felt this great burden, like, God, maybe you're telling me to do this. Maybe you're telling me to leave my comfortable position as cupbearer to the king of Persia to go and lead that project. So he prayed about it and prayed about it, and, and he planned some things. So then the moment came where he went before King Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, and here's what he said. He said to the king, if it pleases you, and if I found favor in your sight, send me to the city of my father so I may rebuild it. And the king said, sounds good to me. And then he said, hmm, well, if it pleases the king, would you give me letters to the governors of the regions that I pass through so I can have safe travel? Consider it done. That was his yes. I, what if we take our plans before the Lord like Nehemiah and say, God, if it, here's what I'm thinking. This is the ministry I'm thinking of starting. This is the business I want to create. This is the, this is the book I want to write. Whatever it is. And we say, God, this is, this is what I'm thinking. If it pleases you, and if I found favor in your sight for you to bless me, would you make it so? I mean, think what God would say. I think God would say, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. When, when I was a young Christian, I memorized this verse. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. It was an NIV version, a little different from this one, but that was the verse. Commit your way to the Lord, your plans will succeed. Commit, dedicate them, consider it a, a holy thing. God, I really want this to honor you. I want to please you with this. I'm going I'm to submit them and commit them both to you. And it says, God will, God will establish your steps. God will make them firm. God will allow you to fulfill the plans that he's put 
on your heart. You know, it's a beautiful thing when people set out and, and try to do something. They believe that God's been stirring something within them. Again, I, I love the creativity that God has given us in, in every field, you know, music and entertainment and business. And a, a friend of mine, Dave, right over here, we went to Shields a couple days ago. And I'd heard about that store. People raved about it. I said, let's go, let's go check it out. So I walk up to this place, and I felt like I was at a museum. So I walk up to the store, and right at the beginning, there's a, there's a statue of a soldier, and he's kneeling there, and behind him are the, are the um, symbols of the five major branches of our military. I went, wow, this, this are, they're very overt with their values here in this place. And then I walk around to one entrance, and, and there sits George Washington. I mean, not the real George Washington, but a statue of George Washington. He's pretty old by now. He's not sitting up anywhere. But there's George Washington, statue of George Washington, and then next to him is a record of some of his accomplishments and some of his quotes. And then next to him is statue of Thomas Jefferson, same thing, accomplishments and quotes. I walk up the other side, and there's Abraham Lincoln, another great president, same thing, and then Ronald Reagan. I said, wow, these people aren't, they're not shy about American values. And I go in the store, and they're, guess what they're playing on the loudspeakers? You know, the music playing is Christian music. That's a major store. It's not a Christian bookstore. It's not a church. It's a, it's a public business. It's kind of like when In-N-Out Burger puts scripture on the bottom of their, you know, uh, uh, containers and Chick-fil-A playing non or just instrumental Christian music in the background. It's like, isn't that beautiful? I mean, not, not, everything doesn't have to be overtly Christian, have scripture all, all, all over it, but the fact that this company says, we believe this is a blessing to our community, and we believe these are values worth speaking up for. You know, you can, you can have your rainbow flag of your business, but this is what we're going to put. We're going to thank our veterans with our business. We're going to do these things. And I, I just admired that. I thought it was beautiful. Someone at some point probably submitted those plans to the Lord, and God said, that sounds like a good idea to me. Seeking God's approval should happen at the beginning, but should also continue throughout a project. Because we might assume that if God says yes, go, that, that everything from that point on will be smooth. Like if God, God approved the plans, then it's going to go easy. Nehemiah didn't experience that. Nehemiah encountered opposition. And you know who encountered real big opposition? The Apostle Paul. I mean, when Paul was called to be a missionary to the Gentiles, it would have been very easy to say, like, I don't know if God's called me because everywhere I go, people throw rocks at me. They yell at me. They want to kill me. They want to starve me. They want to throw me in jail. Maybe I made a mistake somewhere back there. You know, you, when you start walking down a path, the... It's easier to start running into obstacles and go, God, this isn't going like I thought it should. So it must be a sign that you're not with us. But it may be the very sign that, yes, God is with you. It's just that there's other things working against you. And definitely there's another spiritual being who doesn't want you to succeed. So just recognize it's not going to be easy even when God says yes. It's going to take work. It's going to take struggle. But God is with you. That's why this verse is so important. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Because you, you don't know what the economy is going to do. You don't know what the weather is going to do. You don't know what other people are going to do. You don't know what the driver in the other car is going to do. But you know what God can do. He's all wise, all good all-knowing, all-powerful. I don't understand all those other things, but I do understand God. You know, in Jeremiah, it says, let, let not the rich man boast of his riches and the wise man boast of his wisdom and the strong man boast of his strength, but let him who boasts boast that he understands and knows me. I don't know all those things, but I, I know my Father in heaven. And I know who's with me in this, and he's going to get me through. God promises that he'll make your path straight. He'll get you through it. He'll get you to the destination. He'll get you past those obstacles. In all things, we're told, God works for our good and his glory. So commit your plans to the Lord. And then thirdly, carry them out with diligence. Planning is a big part of the work. And planning, along with preparation, is what I would call the work before the work. It's the first work. And sometimes it's, it's the most important work because if you prepare and plan well, it makes everything else easier down the road. 
He says, prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. Prepare. You know, get everything ready. It's like you've opened up a, a, an Ikea piece of furniture, and you get this little fold-out paper, and at the very beginning it says, okay, here's the parts. And so you get the little bag with the zillion parts, and you go, okay, there's this many screws and bolts and all these pieces, and you lay them out in different sizes and everything. I got them all. We got everything we need there. Then it tells you the tools you need. You need a drill. You need a hammer. You need a wrench. And, and you get all these things. Why do they put that at the first page? So you don't get in the midst of the project and say, oh, now it calls for a hammer. Where's the hammer, honey? I don't know. I don't know where you put it last time. Oh, I'm going down the lows now. Give myself a hammer. You know, you, you avoid the delays and all that because you've prepared up front. Get things in order. Prepare well. Things will go smoothly. Be a lot easier down the road. Preparing well in, at the beginning pays off in avoiding frustration, delays, wasted energy, wasted money. There are some people who've spent 12 years going through elementary, middle school, high school, another four years in college, and another three plus years in graduate school, and maybe even more to get a doctorate. And all those years of preparation are to do some great work. And they needed to do that. They had to do that to be a doctor or to have some other profession where all that education was required to get to that place where you could do what you needed to do. A lot of preparation. See, a lot of times we want to make shortcuts and say, let's just get to the big stuff. And God says, you know, there's a lot of preparation involved. Noah didn't wait till the rain came to start building the ark. He had to be ready. So when the big moment came, he says, I'm ready. And sometimes I think God wants us to do something, but says, you've not prepared for it. I'd love for you to do this. I'd love for you to, to lead this. I'd love for you to start this ministry, but you've done nothing to prepare yourself for it. It's always good to work on those little things to be prepared so when the time comes, you're ready for the big things. I saw on Facebook the other day this great quote, if you're too big to do the small things, you're too small to do the big things. Be faithful in doing those little things. You know what made Peyton Manning so great? He would study uh, film for hours. He said he would study it for hours uh, and he would look for the little things that other people wouldn't catch. Because he said he wanted to have an advantage when the game time came, an advantage over the other players. He said to be a game changer, you have to be a master observer. We all know because he was a Denver Bronco at the end, he retired in 19, or excuse me, 2016. And I'll never forget his press conference. Because at that press conference, he said something that I've always, I always remember because I think it was the most important thing about Peyton Manning. He said, when I look back on my NFL career, I'll know without a doubt that I gave everything I had to help my teams walk away with the win. There were other players who were more talented, but there was no one who could out-prepare me. And because of that, I have no regrets. There's nobody that'll out-prepare me. They may be more talented, but I'm gonna put in the hard work in preparation. Preparation is the work before the other work. And the other work is doing the things that we're made to do and called to do and planned to do. And that requires patience and, pers and perseverance. It says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. To carry out your plans takes patience, takes perseverance. To get that degree, to write those papers, to, to do the dissertation, to go through the training, to advance up the ladder in the military, whatever it is you're working toward, there's a lot of work involved, sometimes a lot of years involved. And, and you, you just have to persevere. It's one step after the other. It's building, building, building to get to the ultimate goal. And if we're not patient, we're just hasty. We make mistakes. There's so many projects that I've started, like house projects that I look at and go, hey, that looks pretty easy. I think I could do that. So I get involved in it. And then pretty soon I, I realize that, that it's harder than I thought. I don't have the tools that I needed to really do it well. And it takes twice the cost and three times the time that I thought it would. And I think many of us are very hasty, wanting our plans to happen like that. It says, you know, it's, it's the diligent, it's the plotters, it's those who are just faithful. And, and you may have heard this non-biblical proverb, measure twice, cut once. Yeah, I've learned the hard way. Measure once, cut multiple times. <laughs> cut off your relationship with your spouse. Cut, you know, <laughs> yeah. can be very frustrating when your spouse says, honey, you're going to blow that again. You know, you're wasting a lot of wood on that one. 
Solomon said, go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. I wonder how Solomon captured that. I wonder if he was sitting at breakfast one day and he spilt the crumbs from his toast on the, on the tile of his palace as he's looking out over, over the, the nation of Israel and uh, the ants start coming around. And rather than get frustrated or stomp them all out, he goes, man, those guys are smart. Look at them. They're all in a line, and they're all just heading out this way, and it doesn't look like anybody's in charge. And, and the stuff they're carrying is as big as their bodies. These guys are strong. They're motivated. They're, they're like a crew that's been well-trained. He says, we have a lot to learn from the ants. And you know what you find out about ants is they know what season they're in. See, there's a season to store up for the winter. And so that's what they're doing. They're storing all these things up because they know in the winter, harder to find. And they kind of hibernate and they'll have all that stuff for them. Um, animals know that. They do things seasonally. If you're a farmer, you know that there are seasons to plant, seasons to harvest. You can't switch those seasons around. They are just like built-in seasons. You've got you've to adapt to the season. And there are seasons of life. And at that season of life, you have to say, like, hey, what do I need to focus on in this season of life? When I was young and single, it was my education. When I was young and married, it was my marriage that had to be a priority. When we still had kids to raise, the kids became a priority. Clothing the kids, getting them educated, getting them through high school, getting them to that graduation day. Yes, that was a major milestone. But, you know, we, we, had, we had the focus on the kids, and then after the kids got out of college and we were done paying their bills and paying for their insurance and all those things. We, we became empty nesters. Now he says, we got to think about retirement. We don't have anything saved up for retirement. Let's start planning for the future. See, every season has different priorities that you have to plan for and work on. Learn that from the ant. It's good to make plans. Make them with wise people. Then submit those plans to the Lord. Carry them out with diligence. And yet even then, you may find your plans don't turn out the way you thought they would. And that's why this fourth one's very important. Let God's purpose prevail. Let God's purpose prevail. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. In other words, God always gets the last say. God always gets his way. Now, this is a theological thing people struggle with, but God's will is always fulfilled. But at the same time, not every aspect of God's will is fulfilled. Because God's will is for you to be saved, to know Jesus, to walk with him in purity. And yet, yet we all know that not everyone's going to be saved. Not everyone lives a pure life. And I make choices that, that, that are not God's will. And so even within God's will, I find things don't work out the right way. God gives us freedom. But we always want to submit that freedom to the Lord. Like Jesus who said, not my will but your will be done. Think of your plans more like um, creating a direction rather than finding a destination. It's like my plans are moving me in a direction. Because as I said before, sometimes you start moving in a direction. This is what I plan to do. I plan to go in the military, retire after 20 years, but actually I only did eight years because along the way this happened. I, I plan to get a degree in this and, and, I, and I started down the path. Once I got there, I ended up changing my majors, and now I'm going this way. See, we are, we, our plans move us in a direction that then allows God to turn us to the left or to the right. You know how it's easier to move a, a, turn a moving vehicle than a stationary one? You don't have that resistance because you're moving. So if something's moving, you can go this way or move that way. God wants us to be moving, and plans get us moving in a direction. But the heart of man plans his way, it says, but the Lord establishes his steps. It's like God says, plan it. I want you to plan, but I'll establish your steps. We're going to do this together. It's kind of a dance. You get moving, I move you. You respond to me, and, and you get blessed, and, and we're going to do this all through life. There's this dance that goes on. We make plans. God establishes our steps. We can't control all these things around us, but we can give ourselves to the master controller because he knows everything. That's why we, we make plans and then we hold them loosely before the Lord. We don't clutch onto them and say, God, you know, that was my plan and, and, and now you're not going to do what I planned to do for you. God says, I never, that wasn't my plan. My plan was that you make a plan and hold it loosely before me. And if I choose to change it, alter it, move it, you're okay with that. 
See, James got this. In his book, he writes, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go, and go into such and such a town, spend a year there, and trade, make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Maybe you went to college to get a degree. God got you to college to find your spouse. Maybe you got the job to make a paycheck. God, God wanted you to take that job so that you could discover your skills or someone else could discover your skills. See, sometimes we take a lot of pressure off ourselves. Instead of trying to plan out everything in life, just to focus on what is the next step. Like right now, I need to start saving $100 a week. Maybe right now I, I need to go to the gym a couple times a week. Maybe right now I need to start reading my Bible every day. Maybe right now I need to get baptized. Maybe right now you know, I need to start doing this or that. You know, it's the next step. Don't get so like, wrapped up in figuring out this master plan for your life as much as what is the next step to prepare me for then the next step. I think oftentimes we expect God to lay out his plans like a map, like a map that says, oh my goodness, here's where he's wanting, I'm here, and there's where God wants me to go, and if I could go this way to get there, this way to get there, God doesn't do that. In fact, Erwin McManus, who's a pastor, writer, says, uh, rather than looking at God's will like a map, think of it like a match that he strikes and lights a fire within you. That he starts to burn a passion in you that starts to drive you in a direction. And maybe he starts to burn a passion in you for those who are victims of human trafficking. Or he burns a fire in you for the, the young children and how you want to protect them and teach them and lead them. Maybe he burns a fire in you uh, for going on the, on, on, on the mission field and, and help people who've never heard the gospel hear it for the first time. God starts to fuel this passion within you that starts to drive you. And when, we, when that happens, we start to move from survival to significance. Survival is, is when you just ask this question, what's in it for me? Significance is asking, what's in it for others? See, it's easy to act as if your life depends on it. But, but what if you did this? What if you acted because someone else's life depends on it? What if, what if how you live your life will have an eternal impact on your kids or your grandkids? What if, what if the ministry you choose to devote yourself to has eternal impact on people that don't know Christ like you do? See, we can't just be wrapped up in our old world of what's in it for me. That's just survival. It's significance. What, is God, what has God put me here for? How, how, what does he want to do through me for my spouse, for my kids, for my neighbors, for my church, for my community? Oh my goodness, I need to be thinking about those sorts of things. Maybe God has me alive for a reason. See, could it be that your life is, is, is bigger than watching Wheel of Fortune every afternoon? We got to be thinking, stepping back at God, what do you want to do through me in this season of my life? You know, I've been thinking about that in my own life the last several years. And I know one thing that God's just continually fueling a passion for is, is, is this book is amazing. And, and I really want to spend more time opening people's eyes to the beauty of what's in this book and to know its author. Amen. I, that, that's what I want to do with my life. And I'm asking you, what does God want to do in your life? How is your life going to matter to somebody else? What is God wanting to create as your legacy? Plan to finish strong. Plan to live in a way that blesses others. Plan to leave this life kind of empty. You poured it all out for the Lord. Plan on spending forever with him in heaven. I mean, that's my ultimate plan. That's where I want to be at the end. I want to be with Jesus. I want to give my all here so, so Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. I want to live that way. But you know what's so scary? This is a verse that's in Proverbs. This will knock the socks off you if you're not someone who really takes seriously where your life is going. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There is a way that sounds good, that other people may actually applaud, that, that some of your friends may say, that sounds pretty good to me. Not the, not the godly people, 
and not the Lord, but other people pat you on the back and say, sounds, sounds like a great plan to me. And you may think, well, that's my plan. That's how I'm going to live. I'm going to live my life. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to serve God. I'm just going to bank on the fact that I think I'm a good person and that God will take me into heaven forever. That may be your plan. That's not God's plan. God's plan is that you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And if you don't include God in your life now, God won't be part of your plans in the future. You did not plan to be born. But you can plan to be born again. You can make a decision to give your life to Jesus, to the one who loves you. He has plans, beautiful, good, powerful plans. And he's made a way for those plans to be fulfilled. See, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one who makes a way. He's the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, the one in the midst of our darkness who shines a light. That's who he is. And that's who he invites us to come to. And so for those of you in this place that have never given your life to Jesus, quit, make, quit operating on your own timetable, your own plans. Give your life to Jesus Christ. You'll never regret doing that. And he'll take you on a journey. It's like whitewater rafting. It's the most exciting journey you'll ever go on in your life. I promise.